Welcome back. This is our seventh of seven Bible studies for the summer series, and we're so grateful that you have joined us for these. Some of you may have been with us all the way from session one all the way to session seven. Some of you may be just joining us today, and that's quite all right. I am told that you'll be able to go back and pick up the sessions that you might like to pick up uh, that you may have missed. But at any rate, we're glad that you're here, and I, I welcome you. I'm so delighted that you are a part of this, and it is a, it, it is a commendation that I want to give you uh, as well as an uh, expression of gratitude that, uh, that you have chosen a good thing. You've chosen a good thing in studying the Word of God. It is the living Word of God. And, and I think it's a good thing for us to look at some of the heroes of our faith because those heroes are put in the Scripture for definite reason. God wants to use their lives and share with us His truths as it fleshed out in their lives. And then, likewise, He wants to use your lives. So this is a, a wonderful, wonderful process that we're involved in, and God is faithful to deliver. So, heroes from the book of Genesis, Abraham, father of nations. He goes from being an exalted father to being a man of character, growing, tested by God, and ultimately the father of nations. And I've given this little byline here, God's consistency and grace results in a man found faithful. And I am so grateful that that is true. Let me lead us in a word of prayer and we'll get right into our study. It is Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Now let's pray before we get into it. Father, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your love, for your grace and goodness. And now be with us, Lord. Be with us in this time. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Because, Lord, I know that I'll be learning today, even as I'm seeking to be a vehicle. So, Lord, teach me. Teach me your word. Teach me your truth. And, Lord, let everyone who has tuned in this way today also be recipients of your truth as the Holy Spirit applies it miraculously to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 20, first book of the Bible. We've actually started off at Genesis 1, and now we're to Genesis 20. Now, we've not been going through everything. We've been highlighting. We've been going from peak to peak to peak. And so today, we're going to go to the next peak in regard to Abraham. Abraham and Abimelech. Now, remember, he started off as Abram, and in Genesis 17, 5, his name is changed to Abraham, and now we're with Abraham and Abimelech. Abraham and Abimelech. What a wonderful, wonderful lesson there is for us in this. Now, now I want you to look at your copy of the Word, so let me read some there to you. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev, and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of his Sarah, of of Sarah his wife, she is my sister, because he had he had made a a pact with uh, with his wife Sarah that she would declare that she was his sister, because he was fearful. If you remember what happened with Pharaoh. He had made that situation a difficult situation because he and Sarah had said, okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that I'm your sister because that way what Abraham thought was that they might kill him because she was a very beautiful woman. And in that day, they could take her as an extra wife or as their wife if they so desired. And so Abraham, he's getting uh, really the cart before the horse here, and he's doing something he should not have done. He did it with Pharaoh. Now he's doing it with Abimelech, and he's saying, just say that you are my sister. Now we're going to see something about that in just a few moments. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man. 
because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. He said, you are a goner, buddy, because you violated holiness. You violated propriety. This woman is already married, and now you've taken her as your wife. Well, Abimelech was in was innocent in that Abraham and Sarah were not, but the situation is still the same. Now, ultimately, it, wear, it, it works itself out, so skip down to verse 8, if you will. I want you to see this. You see, Abraham is still learning, and God is still teaching. God is testing and teaching and testing and teaching. But look at what happens in the drama here. Verse 8. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. He's saying, you have violated me. Well, in the midst of all of this, and we'll not read every verse of the, our study today because there are so many verses that we could read, but I want you to skip to verse 12. Here, Abraham is making a, an excuse. Besides, <clears throat> besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. We'd say, well, that would not be allowed in our day. Indeed, it is not. But in that day, it was allowed. In that day, that was something that could be done. So he's He's on the edge there. He's on the edge of, of saying, well, she really is my, my sister, but she's really not my sister. She's really my wife. But Abimelech realizes, I am in hot water with God. We need to be very careful about be, getting people into hot water with God. And Abraham was the perpetrator of that situation for Abimelech. Well, Abimelech frees himself, and then he goes even to Sarah, and he speaks to her and says, you will not be mine, but to Sarah he is speaking in verse 16. Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all. They had not come together as a husband and wife. In the innocence of the eyes of all who are with you and before everyone you are vindicated. He said, we've not come together as husband and wife. He said, we were close, but we've not come together. So therefore, I am freed of this. And ultimately, it all turns out very well. Now, in the midst of this, uh, we might be asking ourselves the question, how clear does God have to be with Abraham? situation was bad for Pharaoh. He was in trouble just a few chapters earlier, if you remember when we were back at chapter 12, and then the calling, and then his situation as they went into Egypt, and the same situation was happening with Pharaoh, and now it's coming to Abimelech. We, we might in our minds say, Abraham, why was, why were you so mystified by this. Was God not clear in what he told you? God was very clear. But then I think we ought to apply that to ourselves. How many times has God told us to do something clearly? How many times has God corrected us? And then we went back and did the same thing again. We revisited the temptation and we revisited the falling to that temptation. Oh, dear folks, that's a lesson for me and a lesson for you, how we need to not yield the temptation, but rather flee temptation, even as our Lord taught us in that model prayer, deliver us from evil, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How will he deliver us from evil? If we ask him to lead us not into temptation and we go there anyway, and here's the situation for Abraham. He's still learning, 
God's still teaching. God's still showing him. And now we go a little bit further. Uh, the birth of the heir of promise in Genesis 21. This is so important. This is so very important. In fact, I wrote in my notes, uh, just so I would notice the importance of it, muy importante. What I was saying is, in Spanish, this is very, very important. So let's look at it in verse 1 of chapter 21. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. What an important word that is for us. God gave her the ability, even as an older woman, to have a child. God gave Abraham the ability to have a child, even as an older man. I want you to notice down in verse 5, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred years old. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Now that, that word Isaac, that word Isaac there means he laughs. And you remember there was laughing with Abraham. There was laughing with, with Sarah. And then now she said, he has made me laugh. He's made me to laugh joyfully. And Sarah said that God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And what a wonderful thing that was. Now we say, well, everything ought to be joyful and happy there in that household. Well, it really wasn't. God delivered on his promise and then Hagar and Ishmael are sent away because evidently, evidently, Hagar is somewhat jealous, somewhat jealous of the situation, not knowing exactly what's going to happen. And so if you notice what the scripture goes on to say, verse 8, and the child grew and was weaned, that was the child Isaac, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. She was laughing. And uh, there is a note in my Bible, perhaps laughing in mockery at that time. Remember, his name's Isaac. Laughing in mockery. So, uh, Sarah becomes very, very distraught, very, very troubled. Uh, Sarah saw the son of, of the Hagar, the Egyptian, laughing. So she said to Abraham, verse 10, cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Now Abraham's in a dilemma, but Abraham yields in the dilemma. And... Uh, God speaks to him in regard to the dilemma. If you look at that in verse 12, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. He's going to make a nation, but not the nation of promise through Ishmael. Now, it seems that things still get worse. And that is that with Sarah casting her maidservant out, Hagar out, that they literally get into a, 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 an impoverished situation. And in that impoverished situation, she thinks she, meaning Hagar, she thinks that she and her son are going to die there because they've been cast out of the household. Now skip down and, uh, and look, if you will, at the end of verse 16. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. That The she there is still Hagar. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy, Ishmael, where he is up, lift up the boy, 
and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And, and the story does have a happy ending because God is on the rescue again. Notice here, God rescues Hagar and Ishmael. And then, after that magnificent story, Abimelech requests and receives a treaty with Abraham. Because of God's hand on Abraham, Abraham becomes very, very prosperous. His prosperity is just amazing. God is working with him. And so Abimelech wisely requests and receives a treaty with Abraham. We're not going into a lot of detail about that. Uh, you can read about that later on, not now, uh, later on in the, the remainder of the verses there in chapter 21. Let's go to chapter 22. Chapter 22, Abraham is tested again. Now, Abraham is going through test after test after test. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like, oh no, I, I, you know, this is another, another test. Well, every test, every challenge, every trial, every difficulty is actually, think about this, an opportunity an opportunity for you to see God and see what God wants to teach you. So Abraham is tested again, and God gives him a unique direction. I want you to look at chapter 22. We need to pick up there at verse 22, at, at verse 1 in chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. <laughs> I wonder if um, Abraham, before he rose early in the morning, which the next verse says, and, and he begins to do this, I wonder if he said, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. God, what? I, this is the child. This is the one. This is the one. Have you ever, ever wondered, God, what are you doing now? Why did you let this happen to me? Why is this situation going to be? But there we have Abraham evidently learning, evidently growing. You see, whatever God reveals, he will resource. And we need to understand that. God reveals something, he will resource that. And Abraham was beginning to learn that this was not done. This was not done with the people of God, this thing of, of sacrificing a child. And, and Abraham knew that. Abraham knew that they did that around there. And, and, and he's probably thinking, uh, are we going to do it that way too? Are we going to do it like other peoples also sacrifice children? But he says, God, I'm going to follow you. Now, see, God reveals things, and he resources what he reveals, but God leads, he directs, and we must follow. Evidently, Abraham is getting that. I hope I'm getting that in my life. I hope you're getting that in your life. Look down in the passage there, down to about verse 7, halfway through. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, that's Isaac speaking up. And uh, Isaac has gone with him to the sacrifice. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Now this is getting, this is one of those things that is good for movie making. I mean, this would be a marvelous movie to make. And so if you want to make a movie, make a movie of this because it is a dramatic encounter. Look at what it says in verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know you fear God. You have an awesome reverence for God. You know that what he reveals, he'll resource. 
You know that wherever he leads, you need to go. Wherever he directs, you need to follow. And so for now, I know you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. What an amazing word. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. That's where I heard a great preacher of old. He would pause and say, pardon me, folks, but hallelujah. Hallelujah, God had provided and God provides for us, even when we don't fully understand, God is in the business of providing for us. There's a tremendous affirmation here. He receives, Abraham receives a tremendous affirmation and a confirmation. He's learning. He's getting it. This is a big lesson. Edwin Jenkins wonders, am I learning it? Am I getting it? Ask yourself, am I learning it? Am I getting it that God provides? A friend of mine who is now passed, uh, Dr. Ron Lewis, church growth consultant, he used to tell us this. He, he used to say, faith means this, that you must follow God. And when you get to the end of the path and you see that you have reached the precipice, you've reached the cliff, then you must believe that God will either give you firm ground to stand on or he will give you wings to fly. Isn't that exciting? Oh, I love that. You're at the cliff. You're at the place, the, the stopping off point. God, what are you going to do now? Well, take that next step. That's what you need to do in obedience to God. And then You'll either get firm ground to stand on if God has directed you or wings to fly. That's what Peter found out when he got out of the boat. He was walking on the water until he looked at himself. As long as he was looking at God, everything, as long as he looked at Jesus, everything was truly all right. And as long as we fix our eyes on the Lord, he will keep our hearts in perfect peace. What an amazing lesson for us. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you for learning. Thank you for that affirmation. The death of Sarah is the next thing. Abraham has complied. He has been obedient. He is, he is the recipient of God's in-time provision. God has in-time provision for us as we follow him. It is an amazing thing, and there are numerous illustrations. You just fill in the blank right there. The death of Sarah, chapter 23. Ephron's cave of Machpelah in the land of the Hittites is what Abraham is going to buy. Abraham and Ephron agree. Ephron wants to give it to him. Abraham says, no, I want to pay. I want to pay the legitimate price for that. And he does it as a contractual thing. Now, now this is quite interesting because guess where they are? They're in the land of the Hittites. They're in the promised land. You see what's happening here? Sarah had lived 127 years, first verse in chapter 23. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And, and there's the statement there and, and, and the things that we learn about Sarah. And there's so many lessons to learn. And then certainly Abraham wants to do the proper burial. The, it's the amazing thing that I see here that, that God provides for that Abraham is following God. Abraham has learned. Abraham is ready to be the father of the nations. I applaud that. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's, it's worthy of applause. It's worthy of celebration for, for each one of us. Because you see, God has brought him through. He's brought him through all these lessons. He's brought him through all these challenges. And now, lesson after lesson, precept after precept, a truth piled upon truth, line piled upon line, and now he has gotten it. And now he is following through with the burial of his wife, and we're coming to the end. Look at what it says. We're coming to the end of the life of Sarah, and soon we'll come to the end of the life 
of Abraham. Look at what it says in verse 19 of chapter 23. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made, made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. He's in the area of the promised land, buying the, the property and burying his wife there. The, the next thing that comes up is the story of Isaac and Rebekah, and we can only, we can only uh, share a few things about that. There's some takeaway truths that are applicable lessons uh, uh, that we have from, uh, from Sarah's life, first of all, and we just need to mention this, that, that we must trust God no matter what. We must trust God. We must follow God. And in order to follow God, we've got to be close to God. That means taking time with God. That means spending time with God, just like you are in this study, just like you are in your daily priority time. I have a friend who, instead of calling it um, uh, the, the quiet time, he calls it the priority time. And you see, that puts it on a different footing. It's just not just a quiet time. It's a priority in his life. As you walk with God, and as Sarah and Abraham walk with God during these days, they were growing, growing, growing in faith. And we're going to see that demonstrated beautifully in the next chapter here. Isaac and Rebekah, chapter 24. Abraham's commission to his senior servant, Eliezer, regarding a wife for Isaac. He tells him to go. And you can read these marvelous, marvelous truths in this story. I'll not have time to go into all of this uh, lest we get too far beyond our time, and we may go a little bit beyond that today, but hopefully not too far. Uh, let me just mention to you, Isaac and Rebekah is, is, is a marvelous story of how Eliezer is doing such a beautiful job. He's agreed. Uh, uh, he commissions him, and these two men... They really trust God. These two men, Abraham and Eliezer, he is trusting that his master is leading him in the right way. He is following the leadership of the one who has authority over him, who is following the leadership of the one who has authority over him. Now, who's the, who's the main him? God. And then Abraham. And then Eliezer. And it's amazing that it would be uh, granted to him this privilege to go and find that wife. That was what was done in those days. He, uh, Abraham told him, don't let Isaac go back. Don't let him go back. You find the wife and bring the wife to Isaac. And he does exactly that. Now, this is an intriguing story. Your second movie in that you're going to be making can be a movie about this. Now, you're going to make that movie about Abraham on Mount Moriah with Isaac. And then your second movie will be about this drama with Isaac and Rebekah. Bethuel and Laban become involved in the quest. Bethuel was the father of Rebekah. Laban was her brother. They become involved in this. It is an intriguing, intriguing story. Eliezer emphasizes the urgency of the matter when a request of 10 days or so is made. They want to wait. Eliezer, when he's found her, he's found her. Eureka, I found her. I found the right one. I'm going to take her, her back. You, you've heard that phrase, people, when they find the, the one that they want to marry. I think I found the one. Well, Eliezer was saying, we have found the one. She's agreed to go back. Let's not delay this thing. I need to get back and show my master, Abraham, that I have followed through with what he wanted. And in the midst of all this, Eliezer had evidently been somewhat discipled by example and even by precept by Abraham. He had been discipled because he is following through. He's following through with God in this. He's following through. He's praying. He's praying. God, show me. God, give me a sign. And God does that. You're going to see that when you study through that. It's an exciting drama. And then Rebecca accepts the invitation and is blessed by her family, and her family lets her go. And it is a remarkable thing. Also, uh, she's a very beautiful woman as well. So Isaac, and that's for another time and, a, and another story. Uh, we're not going to get to Isaac in this particular study. We're going to go to chapter 25 here. And uh, let me just mention, Abraham gets another wife, Keturah, 
And you see that in chapter 25, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah, and she had children. And then Abraham, in regard to inheritance to Isaac, Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. And this is in verse 5 of chapter 25. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. Um, it's an amazing thing always. And I, I use that word and overuse that word amazing, but I, I can't see it any other way. This is just astounding. It's just over the top. God is leading. They are following. This is what it's all about. That's why I think we call him the father of faith, the father of the faithful. And that's why we give so much time to studying Abraham. He is such a vital vital character in the scripture. Uh, the generations of Ishmael are spoken about in chapter 25. Then we see the birth of Esau and Jacob. Now let me just draw this study, the entire study to a close, with a few things that you may want to jot down. And um, as we come to the close of this, our hero, the father of nations, part three. Let me mention to you a few things, and you may want to take a pencil if you've not already done that, and a sheet of paper or a pen or a marker or whatever you do, and some of you are fast enough on the phone that you can do it and just write yourself notes on your phone. Lessons to keep from the life of Abraham. Number one, sometimes we act impulsively and at times sinfully. Sometimes we act impulsively and at times sinfully. Think back to our studies of Abraham. Second truth, faith may be challenged to the point of faltering, but as we grow in faith, God shows us himself and we learn that he is the provider. Faith may be challenged. Number two, faith may be challenged. Number one, sometimes we may act impulsively and even sinfully. Third truth, faith does not guarantee stress-free living. <laughs> Did you think it would? <laughs> it doesn't because we grow in our faith. In fact, there are challenges that come and we grow through the challenges. Number four truth, faith that matters helps to equip us for the more difficult challenges that we may face. Faith that matters, faith that matters, faith that matures us, it helps to equip us for the greater challenges that we may face. Number five, God keeps his promises, always. <laughs> God keeps his promises, always. And number six, when we take matters into our own hands, we often get into difficulty. When we take matters in our own hands, we see that in Abraham's life. We see that with Sarah. We see that throughout the story. Don't take matters in your own hands. I have a, a little bracelet that I wear all the time. You may have noticed these. And, and I've got the little bracelet that I got from a church, and it says, pray first. <laughs> Don't take matters in your own hands. Pray first. Seek God. Seek his mind, seek his heart. Thank you for joining us for Heroes in Genesis. Thank you for being a part of these sessions on Abraham. Let's thank the Lord for the time we've had in these studies. Lord God, you are so good to us. You are so gracious to us. We thank you for these studies and what they can mean in our lives if we will be not forgetful hearers, but doers of the word. Let that be, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.